Okay, quick story. Picasso's at a bar. He sits down next to this woman. And she looks over and says, oh my God, you're Pablo Picasso. Would you draw me something? So he whips out a napkin and a marker and he draws something. Takes him like a minute and he hands it to her. And it's amazing because Picasso. And she says, thank you so much. And he says, that'll be $30,000. She looks at him. She says, you know, that only took you a minute. Why is it $30,000? And he goes, no, no, no. It took me a minute to draw it. It took me a lifetime to be good enough to make that. What did that story have to do with anything? Well, today, my friend, we are going to wander through a minefield together and hopefully piss everybody off. Actually, I don't want to piss anyone off, but this is a pretty touchy topic. So before I go on, I want to ask if you can try to keep an open mind throughout this video. I feel like it's kind of a dying art to hold two completely opposite competing ideas in your head at the same time. And yet, as artists, I think that's a superpower. I think that's how you can kind of come up with the most provocative ideas sometimes, is by really hating something, but also understanding why someone else might love it and trying to find the dichotomy and the weirdness in that. So that's what we're going to try to do today. We're going to talk about everybody's favorite topic, AI, and specifically a use of AI image generation tools that just happened and sort of blew up on Twitter. You've probably seen this already, Corridor Digital's Rock, Paper, Scissors short film. Now, why is it important for us to discuss stuff like this as motion designers or even more generally as artists? Well, one, like it or not, these tools are just gonna get better and better and better and better and more useful. So my philosophy is we might as well figure out how we're gonna work with them, because otherwise we're just fighting them and working against them. Also, short of a Supreme Court case making these things illegal to use, I don't see them going away. I'm pretty sure they're sticking around. Now, I know these tools are being used right now on pitches, on productions, for motion design jobs. So they've already made their way into motion design. They're here, and this will only accelerate. So there's a lot of things in play right now, and regardless of how you currently feel about these tools, about how people are using them, I think it's important that you understand as best you can and as nuanced as you can the technology behind them, the legal ramifications, which frankly are getting figured out in real time right now, and that you try to be as informed as you can and not just have opinions assigned to you by an influencer on Twitter or YouTube or something like that. So I'm asking you not to accept what I'm telling you as the correct thing. I'm just going to try and inform you, and I'm going to kind of try to talk about both sides of the argument here and maybe just give you a different way to think about this. And then I would love to know what you think. So please leave a comment once you're done with this video. All right, let's dive into the controversy. So Corridor Digital, you've probably heard of them. They have a huge YouTube channel. They make incredible content where they talk about visual effects and they're always on the cutting edge of the latest and greatest tools. And recently they dropped a short film called Rock, Paper, Scissors, which I think is really cool. Now, lots of people who understand the world of anime far better than me can critique the art direction or the style or the storyline or the animation, any of those things. I think those are up for critique. But what I want to talk about is how they produced the film, the technology behind it and the implications of that. Because it seems like that's where the generated anger is coming from. It's not from the quality of what they made. It's the way they made it. So how did they make it? Well, they have a very comprehensive video on their channel. We will link to it. I recommend you check it out if you want all the details. But the short version is... They used Stable Diffusion to stylize both these foreground plates that they shot on a green screen and background plates that they generated using Unreal Engine. They used a custom trained Stable Diffusion model that was trained on both of the actors in the film so that Stable Diffusion could generate anime looking versions of them consistently. And the controversial part is that to get the style to look the way they wanted, they trained Stable Diffusion on a bunch of frames from an existing anime film. The film in question is called Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust. I don't know why it's Vampire Hunter D as opposed to B or C, but Corridor essentially made a mood board consisting of a ton of actual frames from the film, and then they fed that into Stable Diffusion, which allowed it to essentially stylize the input frames they were feeding it to resemble the style of that movie's frames. And even though they used an AI tool to generate a lot of the assets for the film, they still had a fair amount of post-production to do afterwards. It wasn't completely created by the AI tools. And the end result, I think, is pretty cool looking, and it certainly would have taken way longer to do if they did it the traditional way, drawing frame by frame. So when I first saw the film, my initial reaction was, this is awesome. How cool is this? But then I'm sure, like a lot of you, if you've watched it, there's like a little uneasiness that kind of settles into your stomach. And... 
whenever I feel that, I, I want to explore why. Why am I feeling that? Is it me? Is it the film? What is doing this? And so that's where this video comes from. So let's go down the rabbit hole. What is all the controversy about with this film? Well, there's more than one. There's a making of video that Corridor put on their channel called Did We Just Change Animation Forever? Now, that's a very clicky title. And listen, as someone who runs a YouTube channel, I get it. I hold no grudge when someone has to write the clicky title. I totally get it. Also, in that video, there's a line where Nico from Corridor says something to the effect of 2D hand-drawn animation is the least democratized form of the medium of animation. And that triggered a lot of people, which I totally get. Because think about it, to do 2D hand-drawn animation, you literally need a pencil and paper. That's it. So in that way, it's actually the most democratized form of animation. You don't need a computer. You don't need special software. However, in terms of the difficulty and the amount of time it takes to develop actual skill in that art form and the amount of time and labor it takes to create anything that is lengthy that's 2D animated, well, it certainly is right up there as possibly the most difficult way to create animation. So I guess in that sense, it is the least democratized. Almost everyone has a computer now and Blender's free and there's lots of tutorials and you don't really have to work as hard to make something kind of cool looking in Blender as you do drawing frame by frame with a pencil and paper, right? So if you're a 14 year old and you've got this idea in your head and you wanna make something cool, if you have Blender and you have a computer and you have a few hours on YouTube, you can learn to make something kind of cool. Now, if you have a pencil and paper and you can't really draw really well and you haven't learned how to animate yet, you can get on YouTube and learn those skills too. It's just gonna take a lot longer, like a lot longer. So from the 14 year old's point of view, Corridor is right, I guess. But those criticisms are really focusing on the tone of the video and some of the things said in it. And I think they're a distraction from the primary reason that the people who don't like this video don't like it, at least in my opinion. So Corridor wanted their film to have a very specific look, very specific. They wanted it to look a lot like the Vampire Hunter film. And so they literally went and they found that film on YouTube and they grabbed frames from it and then they fed that into Stable Diffusion and essentially built a really high tech filter, I guess is a way of looking at it. And the final result that they created definitely resembles the film. It's not perfect, you know, we're still in the early days of these tools and just by the nature of them, there's a lot of artifacts and little glitches that pop up. And in the video, Corridor actually talks about how they had to deal with those things, how they overcame those challenges. But there's no denying that their film looks a lot stylistically like the film they were inspired by. And I can hear you yelling at me already. No, they weren't inspired by it, Joey. They copied it. It's plagiarism. And that is the accusation that's being leveled at them by Plenty of people on the internet. Now it's the internet, so you got to take it with a grain of salt, but it, it does actually seem like there's some real anger about this film. And so let's explore that a little bit. If someone is accusing Corridor of plagiarism, stealing the artist's work, that's part of a larger chorus of voices that have been saying the same things about all of these generative image tools, Dolly, Mid Journey, and Stable Diffusion, that they are stealing artists' work and repurposing it and making money off of it, and the original artist is not getting paid. And I think it's a legitimate question to ask, is that actually what's happening? It may feel that way, and if you squint your eyes, it may look that way, and maybe in some cases that literally is what's happening. My gut is it's more complicated than that, and that there's nuance to this that if you're unaware of, you may be yelling at something that's not actually doing what you think it's doing, or there might be something else happening that would really piss you off that you don't know about. So I want to approach this question this way. What are people actually angry about? Because in one movie, Corridor Digital literally stole artwork from an existing film and collaged it together in this way to make a short film that's making them money, I guess because of ad monetization on their YouTube channel, and they're not paying the creators of Vampire Hunter. But then there's another movie that I don't think is getting as much attention where that's not at all what they did. They were artists inspired by this beautiful piece of art and they were driven the way artists are to create something new inspired by that thing and they use new technology to do that. And which movie you're seeing in your brain, I guess it may just depend on what blogs you go to or, or who you follow on Twitter. And so that's why I wanted to make this video. I wanted to look at both sides and really like weigh the merits of both of those arguments. So let's start with 
a thought experiment. I think these can sometimes be useful to drill down and find out what is it that we really think because sometimes we fool ourselves. And before I start, I just want to say one more time, I do not want you to automatically agree with me. That's not what I'm trying to do here. I also would hope you don't automatically disagree with me and you're already in your mind shooting down what I'm about to say. Let's all try to keep an open mind. The YouTube comments are open. Let's see if we can get to the bottom of this together. All right, so here's the scenario. You've got an artist over here, artist A. Artist A loves artist B, some world-renowned artist who has a catalog of art that everybody just loves. And so artist A says, I wanna do this creative personal project to get my name out there so people know what I'm capable of. And I love artist B's work so much, I wanna kinda do something that feels inspired by them. It's almost an homage to them in a way, but it very clearly is meant to bring attention to my technical prowess and my creative prowess. So what does artist A do? Well, they go to artist B's portfolio, maybe it's a website, and they grab lots and lots and lots and lots of images of the work. And then maybe they even print those images out and they tape them up on the wall. So now they're in this fortress of artist B's work and every direction they look, they're looking at it, they're seeing it, they're saturating their brain with it. And day in and day out for months, they are slaving away over frames and they're drawing things and they're throwing things away and they're trying again. And the whole time they're looking at artist B's work all over their walls and they're saying, ah, why does my thing not feel the same? Ah, it's because the quality of the line work in that artist's work is different than mine. And I, I want to use something like that. And so they get closer and closer and eventually they end up with something they're really proud of that is brand new. It is a brand new piece of work. But if you look at it and you look at artist B's work, you can clearly see they were inspired. They didn't copy anything, totally different subject matter, totally different storyline, but the look is inspired by that artist. And so just to recap, artist A, first of all, had to have the years of training and practice and experience to be able to make anything worth looking at anyway. Then they found artist B, liked their work, made mood boards and saturated their brain with it so they could sort of internalize the look and the feel of that artist's work. Then they spent months slaving away, having missteps, throwing stuff away, and eventually ending up at a result that feels inspired by Artist B's work, but is clearly a new thing, and they're proud of it. And then they share it with the world. Now, in that scenario, and again, this is a thought experiment, would you be upset at Artist A? So I thought about this, and my immediate reaction was no, I wouldn't be upset. In fact, there are lots and lots of examples of this exact thing that I've celebrated and that other people celebrate. One of my favorite artists on Earth, Ash Thorpe, does a lot of work that looks like anime. It's clearly inspired by anime. And I'm sure if you asked him, he could tell you the exact artist that he was looking at for reference when he was making these pieces. Like this piece, Mecha, that he did for YouTube, or this homage to the anime cult classic, Akira, that he did. And in this case, some of the shots he made, they're really shot for shot recreations of pivotal scenes from that movie. Another artist who does stuff like this is Tony Babel, who is brilliant. He's a 2D animator, and he really, really likes the style of cartoons that were around in the 1930s, almost that Cuphead style. And so he animates these things, I think primarily in After Effects, but it looks exactly like it could have come out of the 1930s. And so clearly, he's very, very inspired by the animators that were animating these things by hand almost 100 years ago. And he's recreating that, but with his own ideas. And I'm sure if you went to his studio when he's doing these things, there's probably mood boards lying around or lots of reference of the artwork he's inspired by, which was created by someone else years ago. And so these examples I just showed you with Ash and Tony, I think most artists look at that and say, yeah, that's fine. That's what artists do, all of us. There's even a book called Steal Like an Artist. There's this concept that everything's a remix. All we can do as human beings is look at other people's work and remix it inside of our brains. We sort of notice what we like about this and what we like about this and what we like about this. We combine all those things to create something that the individual constituent parts are not unique or novel, but the way we mix them together kind of is. And that's what artists do. And we're fine with it. As long as you're not literally copying something or copying and pasting pieces of an image and collaging it together and then pretending that you made that image all by yourself. We definitely don't like that. When you use the actual work itself to create something else, that's copyright infringement. When you're inspired by something, it's a gray area. And it's way above my pay grade, frankly, to say what is and isn't copyright infringement. I do have a little bit of experience with this running School Motion. And I could tell you that when work is transformative, meaning it's kind of been altered enough or there's a different idea in it, 
it's almost never considered copyright infringement. And just go take a look at Beeple's work. He's using Disney IP in his work, but clearly in a transformative way. It's the same as Andy Warhol messing with the Campbell soup can. He didn't design the Campbell soup can, but he transformed it. He saw something about it that he liked, some characteristic of it, and he paired that with this completely different thing and made something new, and you're allowed to do that. As a human, you're allowed to do that. Keep that in mind. So it seems to me that as artists, we are, most of us anyway, pretty much okay with artists being really inspired by another artist and making something new that sort of references in this esoteric way that other artists work, but doesn't look exactly like it and clearly has their own idea in it. That's okay. We are not okay with copying, even if it's just taking a little marquee in Photoshop and copying this part of an image and then drawing everything else around it. That just feels wrong and is legally not okay either. Maybe you agree with that. Maybe you don't. But in any case, that's kind of, I think, where most people stand right now. So then the next question is, well, what are these AI tools doing? Are they doing the first thing, being inspired sort of finding out constituent parts and features and sort of remixing those in this novel way? Or are they copying? And is that even really the question that's worth exploring? But let's explore it for a minute. So what are these AI tools doing? In a way, it's a philosophical question. And I want to have a disclaimer here. I'm not an AI researcher. I'm not a software engineer. I've done as much homework as I can in preparing for this video to try and understand, at least from an artist's perspective, what these tools are doing. We are going to link in the description to a blog post by Stephen Wolfram. And if you're really curious about what these tools are doing and how they work, I highly recommend you take the time, try to make your way through it. It's very dense. Try to read it. It really does a good job of explaining how these tools work. It's using chat GPT as the example, but the underlying technology of neural nets and these large models that AIs are trained on, it's the same thing that's happening in Dolly and Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. And as far as I can tell, what's actually happening under the hood in these tools is not copying. And this is where it gets weird. This is where it gets a little bit woo woo, frankly. There's an example in the blog post about a model that was trained to be able to tell the difference between a cat and a dog. Now, when you look at a cat and you look at a dog, your mind just sort of tells you really quickly, cat, dog. And as much as humans understand about the brain and consciousness and the universe, which frankly is not very much, we don't actually know how that happens exactly. We know a few little pieces and there's some correlations we can point to, but the truth is we don't fully understand how that works. And so how do the AI tools work? Well, take a look at this image. This is a representation of what a neural net, quote, sees when it looks at a picture of a cat. You'll notice that some of these images look like features that as a human you would recognize. Oh, that's a silhouette. Oh, that's kind of the texture of the cat. Oh, that's like a pointy ear. And that's a thing I know cats have. But some of these pictures are completely unrecognizable to us. It just looks like a noise pattern. But to a computer model, it can recognize patterns in there that we can't, and it can make connections statistically that are actually useful in identifying this is a cat or this is a dog. So each of these images represents some feature that the AI has identified that helps it get the correct answer more often than not when you ask it, is this a cat or is this a dog? And according to the article, this particular model had something like 60,000 features that it had figured out. There's this idea in psychology, and we use the term in design too, it's gestalt. And it's this idea, when you look at a cat, what are you actually looking at? You're technically looking at like trillions of cells, but also you're looking at some fur and some claws and some eyes and these pointy things we call ears and teeth and a mouth, and they're all separate. But in your mind, they all become one thing, a cat. And so the AI model is essentially doing the same thing, just using this sort of mathematical statistical process. It's finding all of these features and building a mathematical model whereby if I find this feature and this feature and this feature and this feature and this feature, it's probably a cat. And those features are not things that you or I would recognize. They're things that the computer recognizes. Now, this is very hard for me to explain. I don't know if I'm doing a good job, but what I'm trying to get across here is that what these models are doing is looking for descriptive mathematical models of features. It's not saying this feature is when these three pixels are in this arrangement. That's not what it's doing. It's building a mathematical model. And that mathematical model, when you have enough information and you have enough features, it turns out, for reasons that, to be honest, are not even clear to the AI researchers building these things, they can then 
be turned backwards and sort of reverse engineer things where you can then say, hey, model that knows what a cat and a dog is, why don't you show me a picture of what you think a cat is? And it can. I highly recommend you read the blog post because Stephen does a great job of conveying just how mysterious the behavior of this software is. They know what it's doing, but it's hard for them to understand how the output is so human-like. And the big takeaway that I had reading this article and doing as much research as I could is that what these tools are not doing is copying pieces of images in kind of a mathematical, robotic way, getting inspired by the images. And then they're building this mathematical model that's incredibly complex and then applying that to create new output based on that model. Now imagine, if you will, that in the future, we did understand exactly how our brains worked. And it turns out that that is precisely what the brain is doing when you look at an artist's work, you get inspired by it. Maybe there's some process running in your subconscious, you're not aware of it, that is picking out all these little features, even things you don't consciously recognize little noise patterns and textures and the way the light reflects off of it. And then when you sit down to draw something, your brain can synthesize all that and output a different variation of it, giving you a new image that was inspired by this work that you ingested. And we ingest work with our eyeballs and our brains, right? Our, our meat robots. And these models ingest it using silicon chips and the internet. But regardless, what they're doing is a form of getting inspired. I'm not sure what else to call it. They are not copying. And so this raises a philosophical, legal, ethical question. If they're actually not copying it, they're just noticing characteristics and then making a new thing. And that new thing happens to look a lot like the thing it was inspired by. What do we do with that? It's a good question. So this is actually a huge problem and I'm sure you've seen examples like this one. This is an article from Vice talking about this phenomenon where the models have gotten so good at recreating imagery based on these statistical models that if there are images that are sort of overrepresented in their training or are just really, really unique, and so there's not a lot of data around what other things in that family of images would look like, when you prompt it with something very close to the original image's tagging, you end up with something that looks a lot like the image it was trained on. So much so that I would call that copyright infringement. It doesn't matter that technically it wasn't actually copying bit for bit the image, what you end up with is a copy of an image. That's copyright infringement. You can't do that. I think a really interesting example of this that's being litigated right now is the lawsuit that Getty has brought against Stability AI. There are examples out there of images that were generated by Stable Diffusion that have a Getty images watermark on them. And this is where it gets weird because I think the natural thing to assume is that the watermark was copied and pasted somehow by the tool and just slapped onto an image but that's not what happened. What happened is the model saw lots of images that have a watermark on it in the exact same spot. And regardless of what the Google engineer thought, I don't think these uh, models are actually sentient. I don't think they're conscious. And they certainly don't know what a watermark is. All it knows is that these images are tagged with these words by humans. And it turns out that these images, a lot of times they have this feature in this specific spot. So that must be part of what humans look for. So I will recreate that when they ask for it. And so that's how you end up with a Getty Images watermark. And you can see it doesn't look correct. It's all messed up and blurry and squished, but that's how that happens. It's not a copy paste thing. Now, does it matter how it was recreated? Technically, it wasn't copy pasted. It was inferred from the statistical model, but it doesn't matter. It ends up with the Getty logo and the Getty watermark. No, I don't think it really matters. I think in this case, I don't know, I, I would guess that there's probably some liability there, but it's hard for me to say because these issues are really, really complicated. I'm actually fascinated to watch this court case go through because I think it is really going to be a stepping stone to an eventual Supreme Court case where it will be litigated out. Who owns the output from these models? Is it okay for these models to use as input things that they're not copying at all? Things they're literally learning from, like a human would. Because we let humans do it, why wouldn't we let a computer do it? It's a philosophical question. I think, frankly, even more than a legal question and an ethical one. It's philosophical. Is there a difference between a human and a robot doing the same thing? Should we consider those two different things in the eyes of the law, ethically? Anyway, here's a thought experiment. Maybe this is a good way to get at this. Imagine that there is an oil painter who has taken 30 years 
practiced every day and has gotten so good at painting that they can essentially do Norman Rockwell level photorealism. And they decide, you know what's not out there that I would like to do? I would like to offer my services painting photorealistic oil paintings, but I'll make paintings that look like they're stock photos. So if someone wants a stock photo of a soccer player cheering after scoring a goal, soft bokeh in the background with the crowd standing on their feet, I can paint that and it'll look like a photograph and it will look like the style of something from Getty Images. But it won't be from Getty Images. It'll be a totally novel image. And so the artist goes to Getty Images and they look through their catalog and they spend weeks pouring over every single image and just staring at them, absorbing them, noticing what makes them feel like stock photo. And after months of doing that, they hang up a shingle and now people can go to them and they can request whatever picture they want. And this person's really, really fast. So they can paint in like a day the perfect photorealistic image. It's indistinguishable from a photograph. And it looks exactly like a real thing that would have been on Getty Images, but it's not actually a thing that's on Getty Images. It just looks like it. And the way the artist gained this capability was by going to Getty Images and looking at all of the publicly visible watermarked images that have been on the internet for free to go look at for years. I find that this is kind of a neat frame to use when you're asking these questions. If a human did it, would we be mad? So in this case, a human ingested a whole bunch of material that didn't belong to them. They used their eyes to ingest and their brain to process. And then their brain has some sort of programming, some algorithm that we don't understand. And that lets them output things that look like that style, very much like that style. And at least in the US, this is a pretty clear cut case of legal use because you can't copyright a style and this has been litigated for years. And so in this case, if someone did this, would you be upset at them? Would you think they were stealing from Getty? You may see where I'm going with this. As it turns out, at least from what I can tell, this is more or less how these tools are doing what they do. They are looking at reference, they're getting inspired and inspired in, in the case of an AI image generation tool means they're building a statistical model of features that they can recreate images that look like those things. But in any case, it's kind of, I think, an analog to what's happening in the physical world, in the biological world. All right, so let's go back to this framework. If a human does it, would you be upset? So if you have the human stock photo creator who's looked at Getty Images and they're doing this, are you upset? I've thought about it. Personally, I don't think I'd be upset at all. But then, if you're Getty Images, would you be upset at that artist? I, I think you probably would be. Because in that case, you're competing with them now. You're doing a thing that they've been charging people for because they sort of had a moat around that business. If you wanted a stock photo of a specific thing, they're one of the only games in town. Now you've brought this competition and people are made uncomfortable by that. But I don't think Getty Images would sue the artist saying, you looked at our work and now you're painting stuff that kind of looks like our work. Now, if the artist started painting the Getty watermark on there, I don't know, who the heck knows? That might actually be considered fair use depending on how they used it. But now, flip that switch in your brain. It's no longer a human doing it, it's Dali. Dali's doing it, or Stable Diffusion, or Mid Journey. And because it's not a human, there's no longer any limitations due to needing to sleep, or eat, or having a bad day, or needing to practice things for a long time to get good at them. All of a sudden, it feels different. And I'm not so sure that I wouldn't be upset about that. And if I'm Getty, I would probably sue them, which is what's happening. And so this begs the question, what is the difference between those two things? Fundamentally, what is it? Is it just that one is sort of less harmful to Getty and one is clearly more harmful? Is there some spiritual thing we should be taking into account? The fact that as far as we can tell, these tools are not conscious. They don't have human rights the way living, breathing people do. So they're a different category and we should hold them to a different standard than we do humans. I'm actually pretty sympathetic to that argument, by the way. But in any case, to me, I think that's the discussion we should be having because from what I can tell at this point, and please, by the way, just let me know if you know something I don't, put it in the comments. I think what we're really arguing about is the fact that something is happening now that humans could already do and were doing and it didn't make us so upset when they did it. But now a machine's doing it and that makes us upset. It's something about the machine doing it. Let's go back to the first thought experiment where you have artist A and you have artist B. Now remember, I mentioned artist A 
has 20 years of experience behind them. So they're already really, really good. And then they go out and they find Artist B and they make a mood board and they put it up in their studio and they spend months pouring over it, slaving away, getting stuff wrong, revising, all those parts of the creative process. Replace all that. Now, there is no 20 years of pain that they had to live through. Now it's train the model in about 30 minutes. And there is no six months of iterating and trying things. It's type in a prompt and 10 seconds later, here's four images, pick the one you like the best and I'll make 10 variations of it and I'll up the one that you end up liking. And then we'll do some in painting and you can mix prompts and remix things and eventually we'll get exactly the thing you want. It'll take about 10 minutes. And at this point, I can feel my blood starting to boil. Like, ah, there's just there's something about it that, that feels wrong in the way watching a human being do this incredible trick of synthesizing someone's style and creating new work from it. That blows my mind, but when I see the computer do it, I don't know. So I don't really have the answer here, people. Uh, I'm just trying to get the conversation started. And at the bottom of this, by the way, I think is an even bigger question. Where is the value coming from that we make as artists? Like what is the value? Most professional artists like motion designers, they create value for themselves and for their clients by selling time to them essentially. And the value of that time really, it's kind of a function of how hard that artist has worked, how many years they've slaved away to get good at making stuff. And as someone who sucked at motion design for a really long time, still kind of does, but worked really hard to get good enough to have clients pay me to do it, I feel very precious about the value of my time that I created through sweat and tears. It's like Picasso in the bar, right? Like I can animate something fairly quickly because I've been animating for 20 years. And all of a sudden this thing comes along that cuts the value of my time, not in half, but by a thousand. And I'm not supposed to get upset about that? Believe me, I get it. And I think that's actually the conversation that we need to be having as artists and as an industry. Because that's actually a much harder conversation to have, by the way. If it turns out, and I could be totally wrong, maybe someone will prove this to me, but if it turns out that what these tools are doing is literally stealing the output from artists and remixing the output of it, like a high-tech collage machine, that feels different, that feels wrong, and I would be against that. I don't think that's what they're doing. I think they're doing what I do when I look at Ash Thorpe's work and then I open Cinema 4D and I try to make something that feels a little bit Ash Thorpe. I just think they're way better at it and they're more efficient and they're faster and they're cheaper and my eight-year-old son can use it. So to start landing this plane here, my gut is that the anger I'm seeing over the corridor piece is actually about this other thing we're talking about which is that the value of an artist's time is going to decrease. And every time there's a new technology that impacts some sector, that's what happens. The cliche example is the invention of mass production of automobiles made it basically untenable to be a horse-drawn carriage driver for a living because the value of an hour of that person's time trended towards zero eventually as cars took over. And I don't think it's an apples to apples comparison to compare artists to horse-drawn carriage drivers, but I think there is some similarities here. And I think basically I'm, I'm a practical guy. This is happening. It's happening to artists right now. And I think we can either fight it, stick our heads in the sand, or we can figure out how this makes us better. And that's what I think we should do. And frankly, I think that's what Corridor did. I think they basically took this new technology and they showed what you could do with it in a way that I gotta say is really inspiring. And I think it's gonna inspire a whole bunch of people to go out and make cool stuff, which I cannot knock. So let's try applying that framework. If a human did it, would we be upset? Let's try applying that to some of the most common arguments that I've seen attacking Corridor. So one argument I've seen a few times is, you know, they could have just hired real animators to do this and given them money to do it. And they didn't, they chose to do this cheap thing. So that was mean. Okay. So that to me is a straw man argument. If you don't know that term, it basically means when you're arguing with someone and you start arguing against a point they didn't make, you're arguing with a reality that doesn't exist. Corridor has a large YouTube following and I'm sure they make good money, but to actually hire a team of really talented anime 2D cell animators to create this film would have been astronomically expensive and it would have taken months. There's no universe where they did that. That was never on the table. That's not an option. The options are have nothing exist 
or have this cool thing exist created in this other way. Those are the only options. And so given that scenario, I think it's obvious you'd pick, well, create the thing, don't do nothing. But there is no universe where they could have paid these animators really well for their time to make this. And this argument also suggests that had Corridor hired actual human 2D animators to do this, that somehow it would have been okay. All right, so let's follow that thread. If that would have been okay, even if it ended up looking basically identical, I guess it probably would have looked a lot better because human animators can animate. As of now, these AI tools don't really animate. It's almost like rotoscoping what they're doing. But if animators had made something that looked more or less identical, but like 50% better, we'd be okay with it. Even though they undoubtedly would have gone and taken frames from Vampire Hunter and had mood boards and looked at them with their eyeballs and ingested that and tried to get the style to look like that, but that would have been okay. Okay. Well, by that argument, then we are not actually upset about the copyright infringement thing. That's not the actual thing we're upset about. We're upset that it wasn't human beings which I'm sympathetic to. And so I wanna focus on what is the actual issue here. And I think it's, we're uncomfortable because it's robots doing it, not humans. There's also a criticism of this film that it just doesn't look that good. And I disagree, I think it looks really cool. Obviously a ton of love and time went into it. Would it look better if you hired cell animators? Yeah, I think it would, probably. But again, that's not on the table. That was never an option. Which brings me to the argument that, to be honest, resonates with me the most, which is that, this will put animators out of business. Not all animators, of course, like some animators will benefit from this and some won't though. It's like if you were a rotoscope artist, your world has changed forever already. Because rotoscoping, if you've never done it like on a feature film level, it's kind of a crazy process. The attention to detail is insane. And AI tools have gotten so good that they can't totally replace a human roto artist yet. I think they probably will soon, but they can probably replace 50% of a human roto artist. So what ends up happening is if you are a roto artist, you need to figure out how to use these tools to get faster, get more efficient, or you're gone. And I suspect that that's what we can expect to happen in our industry. To be clear, I don't think these tools are actually at a point yet where they're gonna be able to do 2D explainer videos in seconds with a prompt. I just don't think they're there yet. Do I think they'll get there? Probably, but I don't know how long that will take. And I might be completely wrong about this. I, I think in the short term, we're overestimating these tools. I think in the long term, we might be underestimating them. But in the short term, I think we're assigning superpowers to them that they don't have and probably won't have for a while. But if you primarily do style frames to win pitches and you're not using mid journey, I think you're crazy because you can whip out beautiful frames and of course combine the output from mid journey with your skills in Photoshop and Illustrator and create stuff in a fraction of the time. And if you're not doing that, I promise you other artists are. And if that artist can kick out eight concepts in a day because they've gotten really comfortable using these tools and combining them with their existing skill set, and you're not doing that, it makes you less competitive. That is what's gonna happen. And I think that as an industry, we should be focusing on that. And as individuals, how do we counteract that? What should we be doing as artists so that that doesn't impact our bottom line and take food out of our mouth? Because I don't think it has to. I feel like I'm rambling here at the end. So let's wrap it up by saying, I can see the good and the bad here. I think what the Corridor guys did was mostly awesome. Having followed them for years, I really don't think that they're trying to hurt anyone. I think that they are geeks just like me, like most of us, and they saw an opportunity to try something that really does democratize the process of making cool stuff. It may not democratize animation or change the face of animation forever. Maybe that was hyperbolic, fair, but if I show my eight-year-old son that video, and then I show him how with his iPad, he could shoot a, a scene and he could run it through Stable Diffusion and get something kind of cool looking or Runway ML's Gen 1 model, he's gonna be all over that. And 10 years ago, for him to get something that cool, I would have had to hire ILM or something like that. I would, would have had to spend a month doing it myself. So guess what? It wouldn't have happened, but now it can. It's a good thing, right? I think that as professional artists, you have to be ready to figure out what the new value you're bringing is. If the value that you brought was that you could take someone else's idea and execute it really well, well, the cost of that is gonna get lower and lower. But 
that idea still has to come from somewhere. The conceptual thinking and coming up with visual metaphors, as of yet, that is not really a thing that these tools can do. The human being still has to have the creative spark to feed the model to then generate the imagery. So I think that that's really the long-term play for professional artists is focus more on the things that the machines can't do. And who knows, maybe we'll never be able to do. Maybe there really is something totally unique about human beings and conscious beings. And let's get as woo-woo as you want, people. Let's go drink ayahuasca in the woods and, and answer these questions while we're vomiting on a tree. But in the end, I don't think we need to fear these tools. I think we need to adapt. And I think we need to understand what they're doing. And if they're doing something they shouldn't be, if it turns out they are copying, if the models that are being trained are just regurgitating almost identical images from things they were trained on, that's not okay. But when they're not doing that, when they're getting inspired and they're recreating new things, I don't know, it's kind of amazing. And I think that can be useful to us as artists. All right, there it is. Let me know what you think. Leave a comment. This is going to get spicy. I can tell already. I'm a little nervous saying this stuff, but uh, to be honest, I feel like we can have a productive conversation around it. I think just yelling at Corridor doesn't do anything. And frankly, I don't think they did anything wrong, but I do think it's an opportunity. It brings up some interesting questions. So let's talk about it here in the comments. And if long winded rambling, almost incoherent philosophical discussions like this is your thing, well, this is a motion design channel, but I do like to do this kind of thing every once in a while. So if you like this, please hit like, subscribe, and leave a comment. That is it for this video. Thank you for watching.